Hello, my name is Harriet Parsons and I'm the Training and Development Manager with BodyWise, the Eating Disorders Association of Ireland. BodyWise provides information and support and training to people affected by eating disorders in Ireland. So that's people themselves who have an eating disorder, but also family and friends. And we work with professionals, we work with clinicians, and really anyone who comes across the issue during the normal course of their life and needs some information and support. Today, I'm gonna to be talking to you about eating disorders, about how to understand an eating disorder and how to understand an eating disorder in a really helpful way that can help you understand um, how to maybe better support a person with an eating disorder. Maybe think about if you're worried about somebody who you think might have an eating disorder, might be developing an eating disorder, um, how you can manage that conversation. And I really want to, um, to show you where you can find information about our support services, but also information more generally about um, treatment that is available and where you can go for that and how you can access that and how you can access information about what to do. So to start with, um, I'm just gonna share my screen and we are gonna kick off. We don't have very long, about half an hour. So I hope now you can see that properly. Okay. So first of all, I suppose the first thing to say about eating disorders is that they're really difficult to understand. They're very complicated mental health disorders. And um, so they're very complex and, you know, they're very complex for us to understand. They're very complex for clinicians to understand and how to treat a person. And really the complexity comes because they don't just affect um, one aspect of how a person functions. Um, they affect really every aspect of how a person functions, every aspect of our being. And because of that, they also straddle different areas of medicine. Um, and so when you're trying to treat somebody with an eating disorder, you, uh, you don't just go to your GP and they might not just um, you know, go into mental health services or be seen by, you know, a psychologist, a psychiatrist, or a psychotherapist, and um, there might also be a dietitian involved, and there can be other medical professionals and allied health professionals involved in the person's care. So when we're trying to kind of understand, you know, well, what exactly is an eating disorder? Um, it can be very difficult for us to, to nail it, you know, to say an eating disorder is this. If I was in a room with you, I would say to you, um, well, what is an eating disorder? And you might say to me, well, it's about control. Um, it's about managing feelings. It's about being afraid of putting on weight. It's about controlling food. It's when a person binges. It's when a person over exercises. It's when a person purges. And all of those aspects, like all of those statements would be true, but we would be saying, but it's not just that, it's also this. And it's also this. So in that way, it's very difficult to kind of come down and, and pin it down to one particular thing. So a very simple way of understanding a very complex disorder is to think of an eating disorder affecting every aspect of how a person functions. And we can divide those aspects into four, as you can see here on the slide. We have the behavioral part, we have the cognitive part or the thinking part, we have the physical part, and we have the emotional part. So when a person develops an eating disorder, their behaviors around food and eating change, and we say they become disordered. So they develop disordered eating behaviors. So that might be things like restricting food, starving yourself, um, over-exercising, binging, purging, and loads of different types of disordered behaviors, you know, in between all of those. And really, when a, the more the person is in the eating disorder, the more disordered their behaviors become. So a person might start off cutting out a particular food, um, 
So say they, um, you know, cut out one particular food because they feel they don't want to eat it or they're a bit afraid of eating it. Um, and then the more into the eating disorder they get, they might then cut out not just that food, but also a whole food group. OK, now that is the progression of the eating disorder. But we are not just our behaviors. We also think and we have thoughts and those thoughts influence what we do. They influence our behaviors. So when a person develops an eating disorder, their thinking also changes. So a person with an eating disorder does not necessarily think the same way a person without an eating disorder thinks. And what we can say is that their thinking becomes distorted. And the more into the eating disorder they get, so the longer that they have it, the more distorted their thinking becomes. So maybe at the beginning, this person cuts out this food because they have, say, a distorted thought that that food is going to make me put on weight, make me fat. OK, so they cut it out. But that's just one food. So there's loads of other choice to have. And for a person with an eating disorder, choice lots of different choices becomes incredibly difficult. So as the person gets more into the eating disorder, the thinking, the distorted thinking becomes more and more distorted. So instead of just thinking, I'm going to cut out that food group, they have the thought, I'm going to, instead of just thinking they're going to cut out that food, they think I'm going to cut out that food group. Okay. And that limits choice. Yeah. And you can see how that has a knock on effect influencing the behavior. Now, added into that is the physical aspect. So when we don't eat normally and healthily and properly, um, if we say, for example, under eat and over exercise, it has a knock on effect on our physical being. So we have physical symptoms. So we might become underweight and have lots of physical symptoms associated with that. We might become overweight and have symptoms associated with that. We might purge or overexercise and there are physical symptoms associated with that. So that is the loop of what's going on. But we have to remember that the physical part in turn influences the thinking part. So when a person is very underweight, for example, they find it difficult to think in complex ways. So they're more prone to black and white thinking and black and white thinking would think rather than cutting out just a food, let's cut out that whole food group. Yeah, because that's simpler and that's easier for me to, to follow. And then at the core part of the eating disorder, we have the emotional part. And this part cannot be ignored. We cannot leave it out because often people would say that is actually what the eating disorder is about, how the person feels, how they feel about themselves in the world, how they think the world sees them. It's about their sense of self, okay? So when we're trying to explain what an eating disorder is, we have to take account of all of those aspects. Now, what is really important about that is that when we're talking about a person recovering from an eating disorder, we also have to take account of all of those aspects because we only really see the behaviors and the physical part. And we don't see the thinking or the emotional part often. So if we judge a person's wellness based on how they're eating, or how they look, we might think that they're better or they're well, but they might feel worse. Okay, so we have to be really, really careful about that, about not forgetting that an eating disorder is not just about the behaviors, that the way they behave around food is an expression, it's communicating something about the difficulty that they're having emotionally. Okay. Eating disorders are life-threatening, and that can be very difficult to hear. But the reason why I put it in is because we have to take eating disorders seriously. And people can absolutely recover from an eating disorder. It is not something that a person will have to live with for their whole life. And they need to get treatment, they need support, but they can absolutely recover. But because they are life-threatening and they have the highest mortality rate of any psychiatric disorder, 
we take them seriously. We don't just think, oh, well, they'll grow out of it. No, it's a serious mental health disorder that we need to take seriously and we need to do something about if we're the people helping that person. But what you can hear in what I'm saying is that really eating disorders are not just about food, that eating disorders are, um, are a way of coping, that they're a coping mechanism. The person uses the eating disorder and engages in the disordered eating and all that goes with that because in some way it makes them feel better. In some way it makes them feel like they can cope day to day. OK, and um, they are destructive because actually they don't work as coping mechanisms and actually they destroy a person's life. But in the moment, the person feels that this thing is going to help them. And we can say that they are functional illnesses. They have a function. And that's a really helpful thing to take on board. And if nothing else today, if you just think about that, that will be really helpful. If they have a function, what might that function be? If we were in a room, I would ask you and I might get the answers like, well, it makes them feel in control. It makes them feel special. It gives them goals to work towards, makes them feel like they're achieving. It makes them feel like they can make themselves more attractive. It gives them something to think about. It distracts them. All of those different functions. And what I would ask you is, do we all not like to feel in control? Do we all not like to feel special? Would we all not like to have a way of managing our feelings? Yeah. Do we all not like to feel that we're achieving in life and that we're meeting our goals? So the things that eating disorder gives the person are actually things that everybody, everybody can relate to. And pretty much everybody in one way or another is trying to achieve. And the person with the eating disorder feels that they have found the way. And so then we come along and we say, what you're doing is wrong. What you're doing is destructive. You have to change. And what they hear is, you're making me give up this thing that makes me feel better. So that is really, really hard for them. And that's why we expect resistance. We don't expect the person to say, oh, yes, absolutely. You know, you're right. Our normal human reaction to somebody trying to tell us that what we're doing is not the right thing is to say, well, you know, that's your opinion. I have my own opinion. And that's a really difficult thing about working with people with eating disorders and treating people with eating disorders is that we have to find a way of creating a dialogue of, um, of not meeting, not kind of battling head on and always coming up against this rows and fights and power struggles. We have to find a way of sidestepping so that we can communicate with them in a way that they don't find overwhelming or controlling or threatening. Because people with eating disorders often experience our offer to help them as in some way us trying to tell them what to do or control them, even though that is absolutely not what we're trying to do, but um, that's the experience often. So we need to understand that if we want to support someone and if we want to help somebody. And I just remind you again, People can and do get better, but getting better means all of those aspects returning to normal. So that means no, disordered eating behaviors returning to normal disordered eating. And I'll talk about that in a minute, that the, the thinking changes and becomes normal, regular. That physically the person is well, so their body is functioning normally and has settled at whatever the healthy weight is for that person. And that emotionally, they have found ways of coping with their feelings, ways of being in the world that doesn't rely on them controlling their food or their body as a way of coping. Okay. This is a really helpful metaphor for understanding when somebody is trying to support a person from an eating disorder and um, what we're trying to do. OK, and I just grabbed this picture from a YouTube video you can see there. So when we say an eating disorder is a coping mechanism, another way of understanding that is to think of it this way. Imagine a person falls into a rushing river with rapids, OK, and they fall in and they're drowning. And 
they're drowning and they can't get above water. And every time they come up, they're taking mouthfuls of water. So they feel like they're drowning. They feel like they're going to die. Um, and by the way, this is a story that I heard um, uh, a, a very skilled person who works with eating disorders um, tell. Um, and so they are, they're drowning. They feel like they're not going to survive whatever this, this, this moment, okay? And suddenly a branch comes by and they grab hold of it. And the branch is big enough. They're holding on with both hands and it's big enough that it allows them to hold themselves up and take a breath. So it has saved their life. It has given them the wherewithal to keep, to keep above water. Yeah, to, to, to breathe. Okay, so they're holding on to it for dear life, except suddenly at the end, they see that there is a huge drop. And if they keep going, they're gonna drop off the end. And so they're faced with the dilemma that in order to save themselves, they have to use their hands by letting go of that branch and grabbing on to the bank, okay? And that is what we are asking someone with an eating disorder to do when we want them to get help or to change or to let go, whatever language you want to use for it. And we are the people on the bank who are running alongside them saying, you can do this, try it out. We promise we'll catch you if you, you know, we'll promise we catch you when you let go. We won't let anything bad happen to you. But we cannot do it for them. They are the ones who actually have to let go and grab the bank, okay? And so that is the idea of your role as a supporter, is you're doing whatever you can to help the person be able to let go and grab the bank. OK, it's a really, really helpful way of understanding what um, what kind of collaborating with the person with an eating disorder in terms of support is about. Now, I said that I would um, discuss and I think one of the questions that came in was also a bit around picky eating. Um, so, you know, how do we know that somebody has an eating disorder? And, you know, how do we tell whether it's an eating disorder, or just kind of normal disordered eating? Well, to my mind, it helps for us to think of it on a continuum. And we have normal disordered eating at one end. So that is, we can all relate to that. That's things like how we feed ourselves is influenced by how we feel. OK, if you've had a really bad day, if you haven't managed to get to the supermarket, if you've no food in the house, if you're you know, feeling really cross with the world, you're going to eat a certain way that evening compared to the beautiful bank holiday Monday that you wake up and the weather is lovely and you're all organized and you know, you're going to eat completely different that day. So how we feel affects how we feed ourselves. And that is completely normal. So we're not saying that there's anything wrong with that. In fact, if we were to eat exactly the same thing every single day, there would be something a bit disordered about that, you know, a bit raising a bit of a flag about that. So that's normal. But where does that normal disordered eating cross over into what we call an eating disorder? I find a very helpful way of understanding where you cross over is if you think it's where compulsion comes into the picture. So when the disordered eating behavior is a compulsive behavior, okay? What do we mean by a compulsive behavior? When something is compulsive, it means that the person feels that they don't have a choice about it. They have to do it. So you put down a meal in front of somebody and they're just like, I cannot eat that. Yeah, because they feel if they eat that, their world is going to fall down. The sky is literally going to fall in. OK, or somebody who binges and purges, if they're interrupted before the purge, you know, they, they absolutely have to get to the point where they can purge. It's like a compulsion. It's like something is making them do it. And when something is a compulsive behavior, there's no conscious thought involved in it. OK, so it's like automatic. I always, I've been trying to think of a way of explaining this um, recently on our family support program. And I used um, the idea of, you know, when you learn to drive 
And at first, when you're learning to drive, you're very consciously thinking of all the things you have to do, you know, clutch and accelerator and brake and gear stick and when these things happen. And then it kind of becomes automatic. And then you might develop bad habits, you know, bad driving habits. And just say then you were confronted with having to have a test of your driving or somebody watching how you drive. You had to change your bad habits or get rid of them. You have to start consciously thinking again about, well, what am I doing? So you slow down your thinking so that you can start to understand where your bad habits are, where you're going wrong in it. And it's kind of like that idea in terms of the compulsive behavior and in terms of how you try to help somebody to get out of it. It's that they have to turn that kind of unconscious uh, automatic behavior into something where they are present, where they have agency, where they're conscious of it. And also in the moment, it is practically impossible to stop that behavior. And that is why if you're supporting somebody, um, planning is so important. Think about their behavior, but not just the behavior. Think about the whole day. Think about what other points during the day when they're calmer, when they're more open, um, that might feel easier to intervene. So for example, when somebody engages in binging and purging, um, when somebody engages in binging and purging, you know, that usually happens in the evening time. And it's often because the person has eaten very little during the day. And so what you might want to do is try to encourage them to eat a bit more during the day so they're not as hungry at nighttime and it doesn't trigger the binging and purging so much. Okay. So just so we're all on the same page, thinking about the myths about eating disorders. Eating disorders are not a lifestyle choice. They're not just a teenage thing. They're not a fatty diet. They're not a phase, people don't grow out of them. They're not just women, boys and men, and they're not forever, okay? And just if they were a lifestyle choice, if somebody could choose to have an eating disorder, they could choose not to have an eating disorder. Um, and what we know about a compulsive behavior um, is that the person doesn't feel that they have a choice about it. And when I say eating disorder, I am talking about all of the eating disorders. And these are the main types of eating disorder, anorexia, bulimia, binge eating disorder. And then there are other specified eating disorders. And I draw your attention to the very bottom one, which is called ARFID, which is avoidant restrictive food intake disorder. So that looks like anorexia. However, um, it differs because the person isn't driven to restrict and, and avoid their food because of a fear of gaining weight, that morbid fear of gaining weight. It's more to do with the textures of food, sensory issues to do with the food. Um, and it often goes with a diagnosis of autism spectrum disorder. Okay, so it can be important to know that distinction. Now, What's really important when you're supporting someone is not to necessarily get hung up on the type of eating disorder, because in actual fact, this is a really helpful perspective. The idea that the eating disorders are different because of the behaviors the person engages in and the weight of the person. But in all other aspects, they're really similar. So in thinking style, in the sense of self in the world, in the way the person experiences the world, that's all really similar, no matter what type of person what type of eating disorder a person has. And that is really important when you're thinking about, um, when you're thinking about providing support to a person. So for example, when somebody comes to our support group, there will be people in that support group who have different types of eating disorders. And we do not discuss weight, food, or the specifics about behaviors. And because we have those ground rules, it means that people can support each other. Um, and that even though they might have different types of eating disorders, they can relate to each other and they get and give amazing support in, in that safe space. These are some of the common features of all of the eating disorders. And if you're worried about somebody, you'll probably recognize um, some of these aspects. 
you know, that there will be often the eating disorder is driven by a fear of fat or a desire to be thin. There's often this idea of a distorted body image, which isn't necessarily that the person doesn't see what we see. Think about yourself. Do you know exactly how you look to the outside world? I'm sure everybody has had the experience of walking down the street and catching sight of themselves in a shop window and getting a bit of a fright and thinking, you know, I, th I think we all don't necessarily know what we look like to the outside world. Um, so the distorted body Im image often comes out as a feeling, you know, I feel bigger, I feel fatter. Um, and that's an important distinction because feelings pass and they're not physical realities. And um, there is often preoccupation and really intrusive eating disorder thoughts and lots of inflexible black and white thinking, this all or nothing thinking style. Um, there's often the idea that the eating disorder has a cycle and it can be really helpful to think about the cycle when you're trying to support someone. So you want to get to know your person's eating disorder. So supporting someone with an eating disorder, it's not about becoming an expert at eating disorders per se. It is about becoming an expert at your person's eating disorder. And I would say that that is a really good focus to have if you're worried about somebody. Okay. In terms of our organization, then, um, the support ethos that we have is that we recognize that eating disorders are not just about food. And therefore, we do not focus on what people are doing. Our focus is more on um, how people are feeling about what they're doing. OK, so and I would say that if you are worried about how to speak to somebody with an eating disorder, have that idea in the back of your mind that you don't necessarily need to focus on what the person is doing because then they'll get defensive and resist. But your focus is really on how they're feeling about what they're doing. And if you're able to ask them about that, they're far more likely to have a conversation with you and you're far more likely to be supportive to them. Our support services are, we have a helpline, we have, um, well, we had face-to-face -face support groups, but we have online support groups for adults and for teens. They're text-based, so there's no video with those. We have an email support service, which is like a helpline call in an email, really. Um, and you can find all of this information on our website. And we have a free family support program that runs over a four-week period where I work with families for one evening a week. OK, and that's a screenshot there of our website. So you can see on the headings, we have lots of there's so much everything I've spoken about and more and more and more is on our website. These are resources that you can download for free. There's a parent's book, a GP book, a binge eating disorder self-help book, a book for pharmacists, a book for dentists and the treatment guide. And the treatment guide is where you need to start if you are concerned about somebody. It will talk you through step by step the steps you need to take to get treatment for that person. We also have recently introduced a whole new part of our website addressing body image, body image across the lifespan. And there there's excellent section for parents and carers um, on how to support somebody to improve their body image and also things like managing social media um, and how you deal with, with, um, with the kind of bombardment at the moment, isn't there, of, um, of media and of you know, ideal shapes and weights and food and influencers and all of that kind of stuff. Um, and there's a screenshot of our homepage. So you can see on the headings there that we have a huge amount of information. So really that is often the first port of call. If you, if you go on there or if you call and contact one of our support services, we will talk you through where to go, what to do and what all of the options are. And we're objective, you know, we don't recommend anything. We feel that um, people need to have the information so they can make the right choice for them. And in that way, our services are very, very safe. So thanks so much for listening. And I'm going to go and check what the questions are now. OK, so now I've got the questions um, and our first question is quite long. So I'm just going to read bits of it and I'm going to respond as I go. Um, OK, so hi, Harriet. My daughter is almost 17 and she has ASD and ADHD and attends CAMS. 
For the past year, she's talked about hating her body, saying she's fat and reckons she has body dysmorphia. Okay, so body, just to say about body dysmorphia, like body dysmorphia is something different to distorted body image um, diagnostically. So body dysmorphia would be considered more, um, I think an OCD type disorder. Okay, so it wouldn't necessarily be something that our organization might deal with. If, however, you're talking about kind of distorted body image, then yes, that is um, often a part of an eating disorder, always pretty much in fact, okay? Um, and so when somebody is saying that they are fat um, and hates their body, I suppose if they have an eating disorder, I would be thinking that that is their way of communicating that they're not feeling all right. And so you would maybe as a support, you know, in supporting her, you're trying to understand, well, what does she mean by fat? Yeah. So what does fat actually mean to her? And what, you know, does she not like about her body? So not to be too cautious about having that conversation. That's an important conversation to have because in getting her to put words on what's in her head. So not just kind of covering it with the word fat and I hate myself by trying to get her to, uh, to draw it out and make it more of something, you will understand better what you're dealing with, okay? So she's in the normal weight range for her height, okay? Um, also just to say that weight is not a, a measurement of illness, you know, that somebody can be normal weight and still have a, an eating disorder. And um, for the past couple of months, she's downloaded an app on her phone for the purpose of reducing her calorie intake at the moment. She keeps it to 1200 per day. And I'm not sure if she's recording it accurately as weight loss has been very minimal. She weighs and measures her food, which is a disordered eating behavior. Although I give her normal to small size portions of dinner, she would always remove some of her plate. I avoid making an issue of it. Okay, she's 17. Some days she gets into a really bad mood because she thinks she's fat or perceives she's overeaten. So you see there the link between her mood and the feeling fat. Okay, so that is an important part to take note of. Okay, because what's happening is that her weight actually isn't changing. Yeah, her weight, what, what you've written there is that her weight is actually maintaining, um, but her feelings are fluctuating. And so all the time when some, we're trying to help somebody get better, we're trying to get them to understand that the feeling of being bigger or the feeling fatter is a feeling rather than a physical reality. And that is why um, often to look after the food part of the eating disorder, a person will be put on like a regular eating plan, like three meals, three snacks and not going longer than three hours without eating, something like that. Because regular eating allows for the separation of the food part from the feelings part, yeah? If a person is eating haphazardly, um, they're more likely to associate um, eating with feeling bloated and feeling bigger, okay? So it just kind of settles it down and it's really important. Um, Okay, most of the chocolate she received at Christmas, she gave away as gifts. She doesn't have a mirror in her room, but when she's in mind, she's constantly pulling, uh, checking herself out. She gets really triggered in the house sometimes if as a family we're having a conversation around food. Yeah. So when, there's, when you're in a house with somebody with an eating disorder, I would say to try not have conversations about food around them because no matter what type of conversation it is, the eating disorder in their head distorts what you're saying and makes it really triggering and panic inducing for them. Um, she will watch something on her iPad when she's eating to distract herself from the fact that she's eating. So that can be a helpful technique when somebody doesn't feel safe eating, you know, just distract them. It doesn't matter. It might not always be like that. Um, so that's okay, I would say. She has a friend in school that has an eating disorder, although she wouldn't be in touch with her since December. I said she attends CAMS and they know all about this. They seem very reluctant to offer any help. I'm not sure. Why do you have to suffer a significant? Yeah, okay. Um, okay, to help with her sleep. Yeah. So, I mean, that's if I suppose what I would say to you is that if you feel that this, I mean, it's it's 1200 calories per day monitoring your food like that, that is all really disordered eating behaviors. OK, 
So you've laid it out very clearly here to me. What I would maybe encourage you to do is to lay it out very clearly for, for CAMS as well. And if you feel that this is actually taking over as an issue, then they need to hear that as well. And maybe it's about having a conversation with them about how you feel that this is actually exacerbating um, you know, the other parts of, um, of what they're treating her for within CAMS. Okay. A nine-year-old daughter has stopped eating solids in the last month, complains of a feeling that something is stuck in her throat and has a fear of choking. Yeah, so a fear of choking is something that I hear the odd time. Um, and well, that's good to kind of have an appointment with a specialist to rule out any physical problem. Absolutely. Um, but she's fretting, she's anxious, she's worried about younger siblings choking, is fearful if anyone so much as coughs during a meal. Yeah, I think um, I think at the moment with the pandemic as well, kids are incredibly anxious. So I think that all of these kind of things where they would have been distracted from them maybe more before are now um, becoming much more difficult issues because there's very little distraction. Um, so I think that if they don't find a physical problem, um, lots of support, um, lots of um, talking out with her, you know, what is her fear about? Maybe she saw someone choke and that. And if you're really worried about her, if her anxiety is very, very high, then I would be getting a referral into CAMS to get her assessed. Um, or with a nine-year-old, even something like play therapy, I think can be maybe something to consider with a little one like that. So I think that's all the questions that I've had. Um, so again, you know, get in touch with BodyWise. Um, if you have any other um, questions or you're worried about somebody, um, that's what we're there for. Thank you very much.